Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden of Witts University in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, it wasn't that long ago that we were, we were talking about how China has become one of the emerging destinations for African migrants, particularly in the city of Guangzhou, which is the largest city in southern China. Uh, it was rumored that there would be, or estimated rumored, we never really knew exactly how much or how many people were there, but up to 100 or even 200,000 African migrants uh, in the city. In fact, they have a nickname for it called Chocolate City, that it was becoming so prominent a destination for African migrants. All of that now seems to be changing, Uh, and there's been a discernible shift in the past six to nine months where African migrants uh, are literally turning around, and this is prompting a new phenomenon called U-turning, where African migrants are picking up from China and heading back to to Africa, to their countries uh, across the continent, and leaving uh, quite bitter and disillusioned from the experience. Yes, a lot of this has to do with the slowdown of the Chinese economy. Um, they aren't, you know, it was always a tough, a tough environment for African migrants, but it's become even tougher now. And at the same time, there's also, you know, kind of increasing, increasing kind of perceptions that, that China is not this place of opportunity, um, and that that difficulties in in my in getting visas, difficulties in maintaining visas, harassment by the police, all of this is is compounding the difficulty of living there. And now African migrants are returning. And there's been a lot of media coverage in the in the past uh, month or so, in June and July of this year, about this phenomenon. Uh, Lily Guo, who's the well-known courts correspondent uh, based in Nairobi, Kenya, she wrote a story called African Migrants Are Returning from China and Telling Their Compatriots Not to Go. And then Jenny Marsh, who we've had on the show as well, she's at CNN and wrote an article for CNN.com saying the African migrants giving up on the Chinese dream. Now, a lot of this new coverage uh, has been prompted in part by a new website that came out called U-TurnAsia.com. And it is such a powerful site that tells the story of migrants from the Gambia, only the Gambia. And it was created by uh, two scholars, and we're thrilled to have them both on the show today. Heidi Osbo Haugen, who is at the Department of Sociology and Human Geography, at the University of Oslo. Uh, very good morning to you, Heidi. Good morning. And we're also thrilled to have Manon Dirich uh, from the Department of Cultural and Social Anthropology at the University of Cologne. Uh, thank you for joining us, Manon. Hello. Thanks for having me. <laughs> well, congratulations on the website. It is a beautiful piece of work, uh, fascinating as well. I guess I'd like to start our conversation, you know, stepping back from this whole migration debate because you have started to document this kind of remigration and repatriation process at a very interesting time in history. I mean, we are seeing right now the more people on the move than at any time since the end of World War II. And the migration to China is in part coming from the fact that a lot of the migrants from the Gambia simply couldn't make it to Europe or their preferred destinations. And I'd like you to kind of set up for us And I'll start with you, Heidi, to help us set up the context for this migration in the bigger picture about why people are so desperate to leave the Gambia that they would go to either Europe or eventually even to China. Well, Gambia has, of course, a long history of connections with the rest of the world through tourism and also through emigration. And it used to be quite easy to go from the Gambia to Europe. Then, as you all know, in the past couple of decades, Europe has closed its borders and still new opportunities in the Gambia haven't opened up. So that means people are looking for some way to realize the dream that the previous generation could realize through migration. And when the borders to Europe are closed, naturally, they will try to find other places to go. Um, so, Manon, how did you manage to to kind of gather all of these stories? The the site is really innovative and, and evocative in the sense that it, it weaves together lots of different stories from lots of different people. Um, and mm-hmm. I was wondering how you managed to actually gather those stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was doing my research in Guangzhou in 2014 and 15, and um, that's when, like, during my research, I met some Gambian men working as waiters in um, restaurants run by African women. And I think, like, I got, like, I realized how precarious their situations were when, uh, like, one of them got uh, arrested by the police and finally jailed and then also deported, and I joined 
Like I joined him at the airport and um, that's when slowly other Gambian men started opening up and talking about their experiences, like why they came to China and also their experiences in China. And um, so I started meeting like with a group, like with two groups of people who were like around 40 people. And um, yeah, I think like it was just this, like this experience of seeing like these young men um, like entering their apartment for the first time and just like them telling these similar stories about their experiences. Um, I think it was like, we really tried to figure out like what to do on a practical basis, but then they were very eager as well to tell their stories and really share it with their peers in the Gambia in order also to stop other people from what they called falling into the same trap. Yeah, now that, And I think that's like how... Yeah, that trap that you talk about is, and, and you describe this in great detail on the website, and, and I'll, I'll paint a broad brush here just for people who haven't seen the site, is that there are the Nigerian visa dealers. Mm -hmm. And uh, if there are villains in this story, uh, just like in the migration from Syria, the smugglers are considered to be the villains, one could or make a very compelling argument that the Nigerian visa dealers in the Gambia are the villains here, in part because they're selling them a dream that doesn't really exist. They're saying you well, can... But let me, sorry, uh, let me yeah. just also uh, <laughs> posit another villain, a potential villain in this story. And that would be the, the, the nature of the economy these days that makes it impossible for people to just become adults in the Gambia without going abroad. Yeah. Like the structural violence that is imposed mm -hmm. by the, the world system on these people that makes emigration the only, in their view, the only opportunity for social advancement. So you might as well say that Europe is the villain or the U.S. is the villain in okay. this story. Okay, but, but what's new about that? That's not a new thing. We've had you know, inequality you know, between countries and regions for, you know, for as long as time. I mean, what, what about that is, is relatively new that would force such a mass migration today? If I can answer to that, to that question, or just like, um, I think like what Heidi said is a really important aspect, like these social cultural dim dimensions, which are linked to like economy and the fact that like young people, they don't have access to um, actually being um, like social, socially acknowledged in their society. And um, I think that's like really like, it's very, very like it puts a lot of, of pressure on these young, especially young men. And um, I think that, for example, in the Gambia, it's um, like what Heidi described before, that like previous generations like had different experiences. And then also like if there are opportunities popping up, for example, like people promising that China might be a new destination, I think that's something that like people really triggers people's um, images or imaginaries of what they could become by migrating. Uh, Heidi, before so there's I wonder, really a generational I wonder, shift. Yeah, sorry. Go, go ahead, Heidi. Sorry. Yeah, no, there's really a general a generational shift that the previous generation could actually go to Europe and make some money and realize their dream. In the Gambia, also tourism was booming in the 80s. So through like various forms of interconnections with the rest of the world, people could establish themselves as social men in this case. So someone who could provide for their larger families and settle down with children and and a wife. Yeah, and and I, I think I there's think you know, like, kind of an, another kind of historical, you know, kind of problem with that we see is that in, in the, we've had several societies like this, um, you know, kind of in the past where society where adulthood is essentially marked by migration, um, you know, at like a, a you know, I'm, I'm not a migration expert, but, you know, kind of what I've heard of, for example, like some, some communities in Fujian in China, you know, kind of where also like you, you, as an adult, you, you leave. That's kind of what you do and you send money back. I think I think the, the, what, what's probably a bit different now is that the, 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 all of the, the destinations that people want to go to, those states are increasingly just deploying a lot of structural violence and a lot of just technology just to try and keep people out. Like these the states are increasingly 
turning themselves into these citadels. And you don't have a kind of a natural process of migration the way that you saw, for example, the Japanese moving to California or to Brazil, you know, kind of like in, in the in the early, 10, early 20th century. I'm not sure if I'm if I'm correct there. Yeah. And well, it's beyond the technology. It's also that the world economy has changed, you know, and so we are in a situation now where the West is in a kind of semi-permanent, if not permanent, period of low economic growth. Japan included in that as well. And so the the demand to control immigration uh, is more paramount than ever from, from constituencies in Europe and the United States. Uh, Japan, Kobus, as you know, has always been an anti-immigrant type of country. Um, but in, in China now, they're also entering into a period of sustained low economic growth. And so the pressure to kind of push back on immigrants and to turn turn them away uh, becomes ever more prominent from from public opinion. I guess, you know, so we talked about the villains here, but then they sold this expectation to a lot of these young men who had these dreams of going and making up to $1,500 a week, uh, getting good jobs. They had this idea that because China's the world's second largest economy, there must be some work that's there. And when they get to Guangzhou and they don't know anything about the city uh, or the country, they find out that it's a quite expensive city. In fact, Guangzhou has a standard of living that is really on par with much of Europe. And they get there and they don't have money and they don't have contacts, they don't have resources. And and then – so pick up the story, Manon, from there and tell us what happens when mm-hmm. they run into that reality that this is going to be really difficult. Yeah, I think that's also what we tried to illustrate on the page, like by really giving the word to these letters and um, the material that the boys or the men gathered themselves. And um, I think like at the beginning, it was really like being at the airport, driving to the apartment or the inner city was very exciting. Like some of them talked about how they felt like. Yeah, I don't know, like kings or like really very proud also to have traveled and finally like succeed. And then I think like, um, yeah, just very quickly became like like they when they were confronted to what really happened on the ground and um also being surrounded by so many other people going through the same experience i think that really like triggered a lot of um like a lot of stress and it's it just like like people got aware very quickly that okay this is really not what we imagined and um but then it was the problem like there are several problems the first is that many didn't want to return like from the very beginning because they were still like this hope to succeed was so big so and then also the shame that is linked to returning with idle hands and the other thing is that there were still like there were a lot of discourses or a lot of like rumors about going to Hong Kong or going to Taiwan or Thailand like other destinations destinations in Asia, um, that there might be opportunities. And so it was always like this hope was really fooled. Fool, how do you say it? Like fooled? Mm. Um, yeah. do, do, you, do you see that, that the, as these narratives are developing, is that, do, you, do you think this is going to change the way that Asia and China particularly is seen in Africa? Or is it too early to see that kind of change in Gambia and other African countries? I think that China is still like in terms of really like a migration destination. It's not like in terms of what I experience. It it's not as present as yeah, still like Europe due or the U.S. due to historical reasons. And um, but I do think like although now like things are changing very quickly. Things you already mentioned like economy or politics, and these are also things that like people get aware of very quickly and like information that is like um communi- communicated via networks so um yeah I'm, I'm not really to be honest i'm not really sure how it's going to like change the relations or also these migration f- like flows or um and it's, I don't know how it's been see. interesting after the website was uh, launched that um some of the fears that the migrants had about how they would be received back home have actually materialized so um, we've had emails saying these people are just lazy, it's typical of Gambians, mm-hmm. their English is not good enough. So really putting the blame for the situation on the Gambians themselves. Yeah, it, it's mm-hmm. interesting because shame seems to play a very powerful role here. That the, the migrants, you know, recognize that oftentimes to, to spend the 2,000 euros to buy the plane ticket and to get the visas and to, to make the trip – families had to kind of scrape together and make sacrifices to do this with a lot of hope and expectation that it would 
result in money coming back home. And so there's this concept of shame that they can't face their relatives and their family and their friends who, who, got, who brought them money to, or helped them to get there. Talk to us a little bit about that notion. And you're talking about the public shaming that other people are giving, but what about the private familial shame that comes with returning home empty-handed? I think that was very clear when I was visiting the Gambians after they had returned. So some some would go back, but you know, with a very heavy heart, but go back and face their family right away, saying, I have nothing to be ashamed of, uh, so I just have to face people and get it over with, sort of like ripping off a Band-Aid quickly. Whereas others couldn't even go home to their village after they had been maybe imprisoned in China or been very scared for a long time, they didn't feel comfortable back home anymore. So they would stay with friends out of the city uh, or they would find some other ways of avoiding to face people. And uh, one man, for example, said that he returned to his mother's compound and this was a family with several wives who all had children and felt that the other wives were looking gleefully at his mother and him, you know, uh, sort of having their expectation that he would never make it reconfirmed when he returned empty-handed. Yeah, it's also something like when I was in Guangzhou, I was also sometimes um, like, um, yeah, it really like struck me the like the pressure the men were facing and like also as, just like um, Heidi explained about like the men returning that they didn't contact their families. It was also like some of the men like did not contact their families at all. And those who did like they they also faced enormous expectations and some even talked about like being pushed by their families to try harder and really not to come back and like try other destinations or do whatever but not coming back because I think like it's also this concept of shame is not just like this individual shame but as you just mentioned like the whole family is kind of involved in this project and like financially and also emotionally and in like socially so I think it's it really yeah it's like a very broad concept that that's really important in this situation. Um, on a wider scale, um, you know, we we've now suddenly, uh, you know, over the last two two or three weeks, or I've become aware of the concept of U-turning, and you know, kind of a lot of people pointing out that this this kind of tide of migration seems to be turning, or that there's more people returning. Has there been? I assume there's been people obviously flowing back and forth, and, and a bunch of people returning over time. Are we seeing a significant, in real real numbers, a significant increase in, in Africans returning from, from China? Or is it a situation where once we have a name for it, we become more aware of it as a, as a phenomenon? I think there are two ways of leaving China. So one is the U-turning that you mentioned, where uh, people go, uh, they think they can make money, they very quickly run into problems, and then either by being uh, incarcerated and then sent out or... Uh, by realizing their situation and, and managing to get out before their visa run out, they return home. But uh, in 2014, when I was living in Guangzhou, also, there were also a lot of people who had been staying there for a long time, maybe seven, eight years, making a living by guiding people around markets or by following up on production orders that they had. So being there... A person in Guangzhou when uh, they were staying in Nigeria or the Congo or wherever they were making the orders from. And because of exchange rate changes uh, of African currencies and just because there are more Africans ordering directly from China now, the competition is so tough. So while previous profit margins would allow to give these allow for cuts for these like agents based in China, that's not the case anymore. So I would accompany people to the airport who had built a house back home with money that they had earned by being an intermediary, an agent living in China, but now couldn't even afford the bus ride to the airport. Hmm. So, and that's really, uh, that's more of a, a macro uh, change that is affecting those who have been there long term. So we do see people who have come and are contributing the, to the economy in China, but are now forced to leave, in addition to the people you turning, as you say. You know, Manon, when I was reading through the site and listening to the stories and watching the videos, 
and kind of absorbing it all. Uh, you know, this this very somewhat politically incorrect kind of notion came to me, how unfair it seems that, you know, we don't know exactly how many Chinese are in Africa, but the estimates go, you know, to several hundred thousand to a million to as high as two million. Who knows? But we know it's a lot of people. And it just mm-hmm. – and, 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 and it seems like Chinese migrants live, for the most part, unfettered. I mean, they don't face the same kind of pressures that African migrants in China face in terms of – Threats from the police, threats from you know enforcement officials. Uh, there, it it just seems an easier existence. And again, I might be speaking completely out of turn here, but when you were doing this, did it occur to you? And you, did you reflect on that that duality here between you know what African migrants in China have to face and what Chinese migrants in Africa confront, and the two realities that are so different from one another? Yeah, like first of first of all, like very often people like my informants or um, were talking about like how and un- like exactly in the terms you put it, like how unfair it is the way they treated in China and compared to like Chinese being treated in like their home countries. But I would still be. Um, yeah, I think it's like it has a lot to do with like with projecting your own frustrations, like which are really like we, which are real and also like due to like really structural um, forces like uh, working in your everyday life and like as an African or in China. But um, like, yeah, I'm really like my focus is on Africans in China. So I kind of like when I was in Senegal, I was also like I talked to some um like Chinese or I, but um, I think that like just the structural um, like context is very different in the different countries. And I think that um, also the migration policies in China have like become like even stricter, for example, when we take the example of um, the Gambians, it was very clear that like slowly Hong Kong, for example, closes its borders to um to people from the Gambia or they like finally ended up needing a visa. And um, so I think we really have to look like, yeah, very like on local phenomena and really see what's like, what is happening and why is it happening? And also what Heidi said, like connected to broader phenomena, like um, the economic and political situations changing. Um, I think it's hard to really see it in this dichotomous categories. Um, you know, over the last last two or three, you know, kind of decades, I guess a little bit less. Um, Guangzhou and Iwu have become these centres of African business and African trade. Um, to you know, the the the, the trade in, in frequently Chinese made goods and sending them back to Africa. Um, are we is if 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 you project into the future, do you see that that kind of political what what I mean that that economy diminishing? Do is uh, my 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 question in other words is do you foresee a kind of economic impact on these Chinese cities of large amounts of African migrants leaving and to, and essentially taking African business with them? No, it just like it, yeah, just like a few days ago, I was like writing with one of my Chinese friends. She's uh, having a business in Xiaobei, working like she's been working with Africans, especially Congolese, for quite a time. And yeah, she's really like she's, for example, like just on this very personal level, like she's really suffering from the the economic um, like the economic crisis in Europe, and then also all these African. Um, um, traders that simply do not reappear or cannot pay their bills. So I think there is like a big impact also for local communities or communities in Guangzhou who really depends on these people to make their living. Heidi, and there has been some organization actually around <laughs> the cause of um, not making visa uh, restrictions more tough or not making they have restrictions on where Africans can live so you can't live in Xiaobei now unless you have a more permanent visa than most of these Africans have and this is directly impacting the house owners and they have organized to try to make the government go back on on like stricter requirements that they put but I think at the if we look at it at a broader level China is really torn between two (laughs) kinds of um interests and one is the like immediate economic interest that i think local government officials are more in a place to see so in foshan for example there are so many factories that cater mostly to africans or africans and arabs 
so they've been, you know, initially they've been much more positive towards African people living there because they knew that these people being there contributed to the economy in various ways, both through rent, but also through placing orders with the factories. But then you also have um, political pressure, and this often comes from uh, educated people or people who are not directly involved in this petty trade from China to Africa, where they say China already has a lot of people. Why do we need any more coming? Uh, and there's also a racial aspect to that kind of pressure where you say that there's, for example, where when there are stories about mixed um, cup, mixed race couples, they say, well, the children of Africans and Chinese are always black. So it's kind of a racial invasion. You're not suggesting and I didn't see anywhere in your site uh, that it said this. So I'm projecting this. So I don't want anybody to kind of take the wrong. <laughs> the wrong there's a little disclaimer here the wrong impression, but you're not suggesting necessarily that China be more tolerant for immigrants uh, by doing this site. Is that, is that one of the, the subtexts of what you're, you're, you're trying to do, Heidi, in terms of, uh, you know, kind of maybe not trying to persuade, but you wishing in some ways that China was more tolerant and accepting more, more immigrants? Because you did raise a very interesting point from the Chinese point of view, um, you know, life is very hard for, for the vast majority of Chinese. Uh, this is an economy that's slowing. You still have about 40% of the population that lives in, in, the, in, the, in, in rural existence, which is a very, very difficult existence. Um, and there isn't a lot of tolerance to welcome outsiders when they themselves are, are struggling. Salaries are not growing. The jobs are, are harder to come by. Um, so in, in, in the, is one of the subtexts of the messages and the hopes that you, you will come out of this is that maybe China would actually become more open to accepting people from the Gambia or other African countries, Heidi? Well, at least uh, I think a first step is to recognize their economic contribution, because I don't see that at a central level anyway, that that's recognized. And that's something I advocate for when I'm lucky enough to meet someone who has some kind of uh, influence over the Chinese immigration policy, that you know they have to... Uh, know that if they are stopping people from coming, they're also um, rejecting some economic opportunities. And we see that it very clearly with the early Nigerian immigrants to China, they were the first to have a larger community there, that um, people who didn't have much when they came were able to liaise between Chinese suppliers and customers back home and, you know, uh, bring opportunities there, although they weren't professional traders when they came. So one has to take these, you know, contingent events also into account and, yeah, and at least balance, you know, the negative, um, the, the negative, the negative things of uh, getting a lot of immigrants at the same time out with considerations of the opportunities that they bring with them. And Manon, let me put the same question to you in terms of what do you want people to get from reading the stories of all these Gambian men uh, on that you've character that you've kind of put together on uturnasia.com. Yeah, I think like what I'm always interested in also in terms of uh, being an anthropologist is these like like these personal stories or also getting away from these macro perspectives and really like not missing out on these very like the people themselves and their personal struggles and also, yeah, very often like tragedies and how they're political and how they tell us something about like what's going on and and gives like, I think also like the page we made or the site, like it, it gives very detailed information about like how different like structures work or at least like what the implications can be and what the consequences for people can be and how, um, devastating these consequences can be and I think that's um, yeah that's really also how we tried to conceive the page and we didn't um, also when, what Heidi once said like we didn't want to to tell a single story but um, by bypassing like shades and incongruities but we really wanted to um, yeah put it all out there and let like people take like really um, like have their own impressions, associations. And then, yeah, I don't know. It's also something, 
yeah, it's really, I think it's political and it's, it's also very human and it's really like pointing at what's like things that are going on, but very, very often are just dismissed in like, um, public media or public, um, discussions and i think that like by pointing to like what's going on on the ground in very specific terms can um yeah can like uh, have consequences in terms of policies or th- at least like that's what's yeah sometimes what you hope or as an academic that's sure. <laughs> you know cobus um you, you know i started the the show by kind of trying to put what we're seeing in U-Turn Asia into a bigger context, that it comes at a moment in time where even in South Africa, you're dealing with a massive illegal immigration problem right now, and there's a lot of tension and resistance from South Africans towards the kind of migration of, or the illegal migration of Congolese and Zimbabwe's and Mozambicans and whatnot. In the United States, where I come from, Donald Trump is a manifestation of enormous frustration. Brexit was fueled in part by, uh, in large part, many people say, by an anti-immigrant uh, you know, drive in Germany, in Sweden, in France. There's a pushback now. And now China's part of that. And I think this is so interesting that we're seeing, we haven't really seen Asia be a part of that, that broader global discussion on immigration the way we have uh, with other countries. But it does seem to fit into a bigger picture. Yes, I mean, this is, you also see similar kind of discussions going on in Japan. Um, in, but in, both in China and in Japan, they're, of course, also, same as Europe, dealing with the reality of an aging population. So they are trying to balance an idea of a, a monocultural, monoracial society, which is very, very, like, a, a much more powerful, you know, way of, of seeing yourself in Asia than I think it is in, in the West. Um, you know, kind of Western countries are, you know, to larger and greater and lesser extent, relatively used to, to a level of multiculturalism. Whereas in, you know, it's you find very non-racist and very nice people in Japan or in China telling you that this is essentially a, a monoracial country. Um, and of course it isn't in reality. There's, there is a lot of migration there, but there's also a difficulty to reimagine the state and difficulty to, to reimagine what it means to be Chinese to include new kind of identities. Um, and at the same time, there is this aging population where they, for just for economic reasons, migration could be very useful. Um, and, you know, in Japan, that's even more, more kind of urgent. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a very depressing and complicated situation. The website is uturnasia.com. That's U, the letter U, T U R N A S I A dot com. Uturnasia.com. Heidi Ospo Haugen and Manon Diederich are the two scholars behind it. Thank you both for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Can we expect, Heidi, any updates to it? Are you going to expand the project to, say, Nigeria, the Congo, other nationalities, or is this this is it? <laughs> uh, the Gambians were unique because they really wanted to get their story out there. So if someone else wants to get their story out there, we're available. But uh, okay. it will have to come from the participants themselves. Well, it is a fascinating story, and I really encourage everybody to check it out. Also, I just want to give a quick shout out that if you're interested in the phenomena of Africans in China, that you do check out Roberto Castillo's excellent site at africansinchina.net. Uh, he's also very prolific on uh, Twitter, and he is w- who I think, Kobus, I'll speak on your behalf here, probably the, the, the best resource for anything to do with Africans in China uh, and, his, uh, and, his, and, and his writing and his work there. So I, I recommend as an ongoing kind of research to, to follow what he's doing. Thank you both for joining us. We'll be back again very soon with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, then you should definitely head over to the China Africa Project's website at www.chinaafricaproject.com. Sign up for a weekly email newsletter full of the week's top China Africa headlines and context. And for up-to-the-minute developments, come to facebook.com slash China Africa Project, where stories are updated every four hours. The China Africa Project sends a big thanks to publishing partners at The Huffington Post, the Asia Society's China File website, Pulse Ghana, Pulse Nigeria, and Yes Africa.